Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Doug Hall, founder and CEO of the Eureka Ranch and founder of the Innovation Engineering Institute, a collaboration of universities, large companies, and small companies dedicated to changing the way the world does innovation. Today's webinar is on 10 ways to dramatically increase speed to market. Now, as we start to talk about speed to market, though, I think it's important to give you a bit of a backstory so that you can understand the urgency with which why we need to really really change, quite frankly, change how we're doing things. The year is 1979. The Western world is in crisis. Customers had discovered Japanese quality. The U.S. auto industry had lost four share points in just three years to Japan, going from some 82% to 78%. By the way, today, it's a little under 40%, but that's another story. Bill Conway, CEO of National Corporation, is trying to compete in Japan and he's having a real challenge. But on a trip there, he in the spring of 1979, he discovers the secret. And the secret is a statistician from Powell, Wyoming. This statistician had taught the Japanese how to apply system thinking to their quality problems and caused a revolution going from the worst to the best. June 1980, NBC does a story about this man called If Japan Can, Why Can't We? And a transformation happens. And that man is Dr. W. Edwards Deming, a statistician who famously taught that 94% of failures are due to the system, 6% are due to the worker. In fact, the prize for quality in Japan is named the Deming Prize. I learned about Dr. Deming in December of 1979 when my father called me in. I was home from engineering school and my father called me into the living room and said, Doug, you got to know this. It is really, really urgent that you understand this. I've been in manufacturing for many years and it's well known that you have a choice. You can either have high quality or you can have low cost, but you can't have both. Well, what I learned this fall from Dr. Deming is that you can have both if you change your system. So 1979, the crisis was the quality gap versus Japanese products. Today, the crisis is how the internet, the internet transforms companies and careers into price-driven commodities. The internet's power is unbelievable. It's created competition global and everywhere. You don't even know, see them coming. It creates price value transparency. I mean, the customers know exactly what they're getting in the price and they have far more control than they've ever had before and they can learn the real truth. The internet with its exchange of information has also transformed how knowledge is transferred. Look at the growth in U.S. patent applications over the last number of years. And when I overlay the internet, the number of internet users, you can see it literally is an exponential bike. People who could never before get to information, could get to filing, could do searches, can now do it, can now connect to universities, can learn. It's unbelievable. And two out of three of the patents are from somebody born outside or owned outside the USA. So it is truly a global phenomenon. The impact of the internet is not just for those small companies, it's for the biggest of the big. In fact, if we go back to that watershed year of 2000, what you find is that the 10 most valuable corporations on the planet are down today some 61% in value. Quite simply, the old way is just not working. Now here at the Eureka Ranch, we've been doing this for a lot of years, uh, 35 or so, 36 maybe, years. And whether it's Nike, Disney, American Express, Lumberjay, Hewlett Packard, I don't care, Detroit, who, whoever you want to say. We've worked with the very best, and we work with people that are maybe a little bit challenged. And as it turns out, recently I realized that we had had some people come just before they died. Yeah, before they died. Or got bought. Because you see, people come to the Eureka Ranch if they're either things are great and they want to innovate and they want to go faster or if they're in trouble. But we also measure because we are a compulsive compiler of data. We measure more data about innovation than anybody else on the planet, bar none, period, end. And so we measure the leadership perceptions of their culture just before their death. What do we find? A world of denial. Agreement with the need to innovate, 40th percentile. Urgency to innovate, 55th percentile. Now you might turn around and say, well, geez, these people must be stupid. No, they're not stupid. You can understand this when you realize that they are literally frozen in fear. 
Success with innovations in the 40th percentile, courage to take action in the 30th. See, these are good people, folks. They are very good people. They want to do something, but they don't know how. Folks, we got to go. We got to go faster. And the solution is we're going to have to apply systems thinking to innovation. If you want to go faster in development, you're going to have to apply systems thinking. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, Doug, I, I, I'm with you, but you know, system thinking, that's for the factory. I mean, we got that lean. We got Six Sigma. We're good there. You didn't listen to the good doctor. The good doctor writes, the factory offers 3% of the opportunity for company improvement. I mean, he only started there because it was an easy place to get data because it's hard to get data. It was then. It's easy now. It's easy to get data. The real impact of systems thinking, the real impact, will be seen in innovation, strategy, and how we work together. So ladies and gentlemen, Innovation Engineering, our mission is to change the world. Our mission is to change the world. By enabling innovation by everyone, everywhere, every day, resulting in increased speed to market and decreased risk. This webinar is about the speed to market dimension. So welcome to the movement. Established in 2009, we start, that's when we went public with innovation engineering. Prior to that, we'd been teaching on campus for five or six years and, and for some 30 years before that, we started gathering the data that is this movement. We're small but growing, 30,000 educated, 50 partners, 20 universities teaching it as a curriculum, 8.2 billion in active projects, and as I mentioned, it is a collaboration of all these groups coming together. So here we go. The 10 ways to dramatically increase speed to market. Number one, mission driven. You gotta be driven by mission. And mission is what gives us alignment. And in fact, at the Innovation Engineering Conference, we asked people what's their biggest challenge. Need ideas, 11%. Ideas are not the problem, ladies and gentlemen. Increase speed, decrease risk, yeah, I could go better. But you know what my real problem is? Alignment. If you wanna make development happen better, you can't have partial alignment, you can't have kind of alignment, you gotta have real alignment. You've gotta have leadership defining what we need and why we need it. We can't be, go figure it out and then come back and I'll tell you what, when, when, I, when I see it, if I like it. No! What is the very important opportunity? What is the very important systems for improving how we work that we've got? We call these blue cards. They had fancier names, but our collective movement, that's what happens when you're, you know, when we used to be just a company, it was easy, but now that it's this huge movement, um, the, the community makes decisions and they said, no, it's simple. We call them strategy activation cards, no, no, no. Blue cards, blue cards. Management defines the blue card. What is the mission? What is the purpose? Where are we going? What are the boundaries? What are the constraints? What's the narrative? And then employees invent the yellow card. How to solve it, customer, problem, promise, proof. Nothing is more important, nothing is more important. If you have alignment, vertical alignment between the strategy and the ideas, it cuts out waste, cuts out stops, it gives meaning to the work. So number one, mission. Focus, align, focus, focus, focus. Where are we going and why are we going there? Number two, do real ideas that matter. Real stuff, real things that matter. I mean, from the customer's perspective, which means you're gonna have to translate, I don't care about your technology, I just don't care about technology. I wanna know what problem are you solving? What are we promising? And then you can give me the proof for how you go and do it. Problem, promise, proof. There it is, a complete MBA in marketing on one slide. What's the problem? What are we promising? What's the proof? We're talking about ideas that matter, ideas that are meaningfully unique. Meaningfully unique, meaningful to three, meaningful to the customer, tick the box, meaningful to the company, tick the box, but most so meaningful to you. You wanna go faster? If you're doing something that you just can't, that you just can't stop thinking about, that you're so excited about because you just know, man, this is going to freaking change the world. I got to do it. Then you're going to make it happen. But if you're just doing the job, it ain't going to happen. So you got to ask yourself, this is the reason why it's not moving because it's not worth doing. Now, the next thing is a bit irreverent and I apologize for those who are offended by it, but I am a representative of the movement. I am not the movement. The motto of the Innovation Energy Black Belts is real simple. Do cool shit that matters. That's what it's about, number two. You gotta do cool shit that matters. A difference that matters. Number three, you gotta change the way you're approaching it. You gotta put define and discover before develop. So normally we've got sort of these milestones, okay? Everybody's got a development process, a delivery process. 
But it's painful to change things as we get into this thing. So what we got to do is we got to put in front of it a define and discover stage. Where we define the customer, problem, promise, proof, the math. How does it work? Forecast, everything. So I don't know these things. Well, that's why we go into discover. We have things that are called death threats. Everything that's an uncertainty is a death threat. Things that could kill the project. And we get that clarity at the front. Now, we also take each of these things and rather than just give them tasks, so it's a 10 gauntlet that you got to run, or gauntlets of gates or whatever, we're going to take that system that you've got and we're going to upgrade it. So we're going to take your stage gate and we're going to upgrade it. For every one of the tasks that you have to do on your checklist, you're going to have what, why, and how. What am I going to do? Why do I have to do it? And how to do it? In fact, with ours, with Innovation Engineering, we literally have 100 plus videos that connect connect directly to those tasks so the workers know what to do. I mean, think about it. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. Who knows more? Who has better documentation to do their job? Somebody running a $50 billion, $50 million innovation or a burger flipper at a fast food joint? It's ridiculous. We've got to make it clear to people. What do we need to do? Why do we need to do it? How do we do it? I mean, if you can't document it, no wonder you got such variation. No wonder we've got an 85 to 95% failure rate. We've got to have clarity. What's even worse is sometimes we have what and the whys are two different departments have got it differently. Get it, get your crap together, people. Number four, plan, do, study, act. The only way you're going to make innovations happen is you've got to do faster cycles. It's called the Deming cycle. Plan, do, study, act. Now, you might have learned it as Plan, Do, Check, Act. He actually changed it in later years because he said we weren't studying deep enough. Seven-day cycles, one-hour cycles, really rapid cycles. Plan, what's our definition of success for this death threat? Do, what's our hypothesis of what we need to do to achieve success? Study, what did we learn? How do we achieve it? Based on what we learned, did we do it? Some of these are easy. Plan, Do, Study, Act. Some of them are more complex. In today's world, sometimes we got to do it. So our software systems are set up so that you can have one plan, one act, and a collection of do's and studies. you got to build that in, folks. It's not a linear world. You've got more dimensions. You can't do a relay race approach. If you want to get speed, you cannot hand stuff from department to department. It's over, folks. Okay, simple math. We make fun of small companies for going out of business. Pundits will turn around and say, Oh, don't start your own business. You realize 50% of businesses fail. Well, guess what? In the corporate world, 85 to 90% fail. Who's the idiot? The fact of the matter is, is in the small company, their advantage is they don't have silos. They work the whole. Think of it like playing whack-a-mole. So we've got to bust our silos up and we've got to become more focused on the mission we're going to do rather than placating our silos. I know, I know, I know. I'm talking radical, crazy stuff. And you came to this video thinking you were going to get yourself some magical cure that you would take some magic wiffle dust and go fickle finger, pickle finger, and a miracle would happen. I'm sorry, folks. You know the problems. We need a system and we need to confront them. You have to have systems for doing this fail fast, fail cheap. Okay, here's the deal. It is really hard to build the road while you're driving the car. Now, we all do it. But if you've got an idea and you want to get out to customers and you can't make prototypes easy and it's slow and expensive to do it or it's hard to get to customers because the sales force can't allow me to blah, 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 blah. Well, guess what? People just gamble. They gamble. You know, when it comes to prototypes, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. You can do a looks like prototype, a works like prototype, or a works and looks. And generally, these are more expensive. So if you want to save some time and money, separate it. Say, okay, here's a proof of concept of what it could work like. Here's a look like pretty picture of it and do them separately. And there's lots of kind of works like prototypes that you can do as well as looks like. Now we've got complete courses in these things, whole classes, college classes and methods for doing these things. Number six on the list, data driven decisions. Half the damn problem you get when you get into innovation is nobody can make a damn decision because we got, everybody's got opinions. Everybody's got opinions. Grounded in frickin' nothingness. Well, I've got a rule. If I'm at a meeting and we've gone, we've gone 15 minutes and we're talking the same thing, then somebody's got to go get some more data, whether it's some wisdom, whether it's a test. But, you know, wrestling this down ain't working, folks. 
We've got to become data driven and data driven means data to drive decisions as opposed to data as in we're data driven. You need to have this sales objective. I remember a lady once had a sales objective. I reverse engineered the sales objective. I found out that in order to hit the objective that management had given her for this new product, we needed to have 350% of the customers buy the product. 350%. Had to buy the product. She says, Doug, that's crazy. I said, I didn't come up with the damn goal. I said, how'd you think you were going to get there? She said, management said to be aggressive. I said, this is aggressive and stupid. Doesn't anybody know how to do freaking math here? I said, you got to go tell management. Oh, I can't tell that. You got to tell management. You're not going to hit the number. This, you can't hit this number. You physically can't get there. So not going to tell her. Nine months later, she was gone. Folks, confront reality. As we say, in God we trust, all others must bring data. You need data, data on the problems that really matter. In about a day, we can run these studies. You need data to help you take your idea and improve it. We have an artificial intelligence engine that in microseconds literally gives you feedback so that you can improve your concept to make it better, improving it some 40%. Yes, now, technology, right now, available. You need to be able to take and do quantitative testing and sales forecasts in about an hour and investment grade in about two days. Running Monte Carlo simulations with risk adjusted forecasts to introduce your new idea some 30,000 times in minutes to learn the odds of success. Okay, so I, I got it. I got it. You're sitting there, you're saying, Doug, Doug, you're being compulsive again on me. Didn't I tell you? I just wanted some waffle dust. One of the things I'm most proud of is a, a fella up in uh, Winnipeg the provost of the university up there. He went through an innovation engineering experience that I did. And uh, I asked him the next day, I said, I said, what'd you learn from that? He says, Doug, I, I'm, uh, you may not like what I've got to hear. I said, no, I'm a big boy, just tell me. He said, well, I'll be honest with you. When I heard you calling it innovation engineering, I was uh, pretty much figuring it was kind of marketing smoke and mirrors. You know, like that re-engineering? Yeah, like that's really real, not really. Um, but I went through yesterday and what I found, again, I apologize, he said, uh, his direct quote is, he said, I said, the name engineering is not bullshit on this program. You got real math and you're doing real science. You're really doing damning. That's what it's about, folks. We have the technology. We have the technology. Our Merwin system. By the way, that's named after M. Bradford Hall, which would be my dad. Named in his honor. He's passed away now. But our whole, all of our research suites called Merwin, and what we know there is, is that it's seven times smarter than humans when it comes to picking ideas. Next up, collaborate to accelerate. Number seven. Okay, so this is the real challenge, folks. It's almost impossible to get people to collaborate. In our survey, big surveys, 12,000 plus, we find that nine out of 10 people don't cooperate well. What we're talking about with this is multiplying capacity. What would normally take you weeks, you can now take, take somebody else's sec hours. We're talking about thinking capacity. We're talking about creating capacity. We're talking about doing capacity. We're talking about opening up our minds. With real cu cu cures for doing this, many to many systems, four tiered security to drive out fear and intrinsic motivation systems. Number eight, smart waste. Now this one causes a lot of frustration for people. Because we've been so compulsive about cutting out waste that we don't start to build the prototype for fear that's wrong. The result is, is it takes us freaking forever. We gotta build in some waste. We gotta build in some issues. Systems for increasing speed, overlapping tasks, standardized components, modularity. They, okay, so you don't end up with the total lowest cost where sometimes you gotta literally throw parts of it away. You know, the famous story is the IBM PC. They didn't know if it was gonna go to um, cassette tapes or disk drives. They said it would take them nine months to figure it out. So they said, damn it, put them both in. They put two ports in. When they went to floppy disks, they took the other one out. They accepted the waste in order to get speed. When you've got real sales forecasts, I can actually put math to the value of doing that. But if you don't have sales forecasts, then everything is an expense and you're not going to go. Number nine, borrow free stuff. Okay, folks, there is incredible stimulus mining. 
wisdom mining academic articles. I've become very wealthy on academic articles. They, they, they put this out. It's truth beyond a reasonable doubt. Patent mining, patents literally tell you how to. They are the blueprints on how to take an idea and make it real. Public domain ones are free. There's millions of them. Easy to find the 50 or so in your subclass that you're looking for. No paperwork required. I got it, folks. They're written horrifically. I got that. But I'm telling you, somebody else has figured it out. And most of these inventors are so inept at communicating it, they got brilliant stuff that nobody's used. And even though they're in the public domain, if you take two or three and you put them together in a new unexpected way, you can get a patent out of it. We work with David Kappos the US Patent Office. We have a complete 100% replica of the US patent database, specially designed to help you find these, to help you find these. They're the best starting place to get your ideas and to get them going, to find inspiration and experts. And then this is wicked cool. So as it turns out, 250,000 times a, a year, Patents go in the public domain because people don't pay their maintenance fees. So we've got a system that alerts you every Wednesday so that you can see these opportunities to buy patents really cheap. Number 10 of 10, you gotta love it, folks. You gotta love it. If you don't love your idea, if you're not all in, it ain't gonna happen. That happens when we've got mission, when we've got a sense of mission and purpose, when we've got an idea that's meaningfully unique. When we've been able to do our rapid cycles with the customers, when we've collaborated with experts, that are, you got it, it's all one thing. This is not like pick three out of this Chinese menu. It all comes together. The secret to success is passion. No passion, no success. You gotta love it. David White, the poet, says it well. He says, the secret to exhaustion is not rest. The secret to exhaustion is not rest. The secret to exhaustion is wholeheartedness, wholeheartedness. Ladies and gentlemen, we can change the world. We can change the world. We have the technology. We can enable everyone to innovate. Right now, we get 90% plus able to achieve mastery reasonably quick. We're working to make that even better. We can increase speed to market up to 6X. Actually, some are seeing even more, but I don't like to claim those because quite frankly, um, that's because they're so inept to begin with, it's kind of like not fair to take a snail and, and do a time trial on it. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about reasonably decent people. Uh, increase, decrease risk by 30 to 80%, no brainer. The variance in our current system so huge, that doesn't take much, that's, that's an easy one. Increasing development success, ideas going to development, 250% greater chance of success getting out. And most important of all, most important of all, we can make it fun again. We can make it fun again. Folks, we got to make it fun again. The world's in crisis. Our companies, our universities, our governments, the world changed. The internet changed everything. And we've got to change to do it, which means we're going to have to listen to the good doctor and we're going to have to change our system of thinking. You are not the problem. 94% of the problem is the system, 6% is the work. We've got to change the system. With innovation engineering, the way our community and our network of friends and, and partners all around the world do it, is it starts out with education. Cycles to mastery education that enables anyone to get mastery to become innovation engineering. Black belts, green belts, and blue belts. Intelligent tools, world-class tools that amplify the education ability, and we activate these through acceleration mentoring helping you make sure that these aren't just classes you do, but you make it real. Ladies and gentlemen, our mission is to change the world. Our mission is to change the world by enabling innovation, by everyone, everywhere, every day, resulting in increased speed to market and decreased risk. And the most important words are to market. Ladies and gentlemen, we are literally within hours of releasing what's called Innovation Engineering 3.0, the third complete version of the curriculum, the lab sites, the black belt systems, the, the collaboration systems, the diffusion systems. And when you have gone through the process of an idea from the beginning to seeing the idea ship, man, it, man it's wicked cool. It is wicked cool. And when we get everybody to have seen and felt that, 
that instead of us debating, why do we innovate? Why do we need to do this? It's going to happen. So we're teaching executives and companies, taking it across companies, and we're teaching on campus. But I will tell you, we are going to change the world. We're going to change the world. I tell the students on campus, they have plan B. Plan A is we're going to work on changing your parents. We're going to get them fired up, things like this, to get them going. If that doesn't work, then we're going to need those students who are graduating as black belts. We're going to need them to do a hostile takeover. Because you know us baby boomers, me included, we're stubborn sluggards. So we got to push it along. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. We'll take some questions. I will be back with more webinars. If you check the innovationengineering.org website, you can see the next ones coming up. Thank you very much. Okay, I've got a question here that says, okay, I see what you're saying, that we need to do this. The question is, what if management is not engaged? Well, I mean, I mean I'll, I'll be honest with you, it makes it very difficult. Um, you can do it without management engaged. You can do it where management basically outsources this and, and gives it to you as something to go do. But our tracking with companies where management's engaged and where they're not, when management isn't engaged, results go down by up to 85%. That's right, 85% is what adults' results go down. So, you know, I tr think of it like when our kids were young, you know, they would say they want to do something. And I say, well, you can do that, but, you know, there are consequences to that action. And when it comes to leading the company to growth, making the decisions that you need to go through, the challenge that we've got there is you're going to have to um, get management engaged. And so they got to get educated. Now, we've got an innovation engineering experience um, that people can do that's an easy way to go, go through it, but uh, they're going to have to get educated if they're going to be part of it. Um, I got a question. Attended an innovation engineering program. Can I s sign up as an individual to get access to the tools again? Um, Currently, we do not have an individual membership to the tools. It has to go through an organization. Um, you mentioned a, um, if you contact your local, in your case, I think uh, you were near a university that was doing it. If you contact the university there, they may have a collective group or a co-op that they formed that can get you in, but, but we're not um, doing that um, right now. That's just not something that we're offering. Um, do you have a separate team for innovation or integrate it into your existing workforce? Uh, what percentage of the time should be dedicated? Okay. Um, absolutely integrated into the workforce. I mean, you, you got a choice. I mean, there's pains. Um, you can try to have a separate team create the ideas and then bring the ideas in and feel the pain as those new ideas go into the system and everybody's heads blow up. I mean, that's going to be painful. Or you can turn around and work with the organization and try to change the culture to get everyone everywhere every day innovating, which is basically teaching old dogs new tricks, and that's going to be painful. So the reality is, is if you want to do something different, it's going to be painful. That's just life. And to me, what we're finding is that it is a lot easier to enable the organization and to teach them rather than set up separate teams. Now, Different from that is, is it is possible for you to do a centralized democratize. In other words, you can have a central team that leads sort of um, some of the corporate stuff, but that supports and the work is done by those in departments or divisions closer to the work. And so that's a hybrid model that does seem to work. But you've got to get the culture engaged because otherwise you're just going to do battles. Or even worse, even worse is this. The separate team comes up with the cool ideas. You then put them into the system. And so we have what we call core and leap ideas, ideas that are bigger game changers versus core ideas that are closer in. And a CEO recently I was talking with who's been doing innovation engineering, he says it's reproducible. He says every time we take a leap idea and put it into our system, it comes out looking like a core. In fact, it looks like exactly our own stuff. So even worse than the organization killing the idea 
is the fact that if you take ideas and you don't teach the people and you don't educate them on how to do it, then they will sandblast off the originality and now you'll have an idea not worth doing. Not worth doing. What considerations would you change for long cycle innovations, five to 10 years? Okay, so we've got, we, I mean, one, it's beautiful when that's going on. Sadly, there is less of that than there needs to, than there is right now, and, and we should have a longer term pipeline. In fact, one of the things we set up on blue cards is we set up on blue cards, is this an idea that is a short term idea or what I've, I've dubbed a Route 66? an idea that could take up to six years and maybe even require six projects to accomplish. There should be a place, there should be a place in organizations for longer term projects. The, the methodologies are the same, because the even when they're long, we still want to go fast. We want to go through the cycles as quick as we can, um, but sometimes there's just lead times on some of these things, it just takes time. But the principles should be the same. Um, can you please email us the 10 points? I will put these 10 points out um, at this, will, this video, although I'll probably have to re-record the front because I messed up. By the way, that was my fault. I was told to hit the button and I didn't hit the button, so sorry. I'm doing three webinars today and I guess I, I messed up on the first one, so hopefully I'll get it right in the next one. Um, I will put it out at innovationnews.com. If you go to innovationnews.com, if you sign up there, which is my blog, um, I will po do a blog posting that has them there, and I will also provide a link to the video so that you can get to that. How can we make time for innovation when everyone has an operationally focused day jobs? In particular, how to best enable collaboration among many of these people? Okay, so here's, here's what I found out. You have plenty of time to do this. The problem is, is we're focused on a lot of stuff that doesn't matter. When we get the blue card set, where, where is the point of focus of what's in? What's very important to the organization? Then we have to go down through and say, are we focusing on those or not? You know, the fact is, is everybody's busy because within their silos, there's important stuff for them to do. But collectively, we're not making it work. And that's where it's up to leadership to say, what are the two, at most, three things that are the things that can move us forward that can make a difference, whether it's in the overall business or in a business unit. And so making decisions, famously, is about making decisions not only about adding this, but what you're gonna stop doing. Stop doing. And the problem is, is most people assume they do, that they, all we're gonna do is add this. No, I'm gonna stop doing stuff that's got a lower value. I'm gonna stop doing stuff that is a lower value. Are there examples of organizations where everyone has been trained in IE skills and tools? There are some small companies that have been doing it um, where they're starting to see those things and we have some large corporations. This whole movement's only about five years old and we're just now starting to roll it. So we've got um, some Fortune 100 companies where they've got you know, thousands approaching you know, multiple thousands of people that it's starting to go across. And so it's just now starting to get across there. So in large organizations, no, we don't, we don't have that yet. Um, what organizations are best at keeping culture of innovation alive and what characteristics do they show? Um, I, I, I hate to answer this. Uh, ben Franklin said it, fish stink from the head down. I mean, leadership really, really does help. Leadership really, really does help uh, to do that. Now that said, we do have situations where a small band of willing workers have banded together and against all odds, continue to make it work even without the leadership. And in fact, in a number of different places, we are seeing a tipping happen as the organization is finally coming. This is not dissimilar to what Philip Crosby taught in the time of Deming, that you had to take the willing workers and do it. Now that isn't good for the willing workers and the people that are really doing it. But the reality is, is, is that it does make quite a difference. Okay, let me just check the rest of the questions here. Okay, the question is, 
This sounds painful. This sounds really hard. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think it was best said by a provost at a university who attended the Innovation Engineering Experience recently. And I said, what did you learn? He said, you may not like this, but when I first heard you saying Innovation Engineering, um, I thought it was sort of like a marketing gimmick. You know, like re-engineering, that really didn't have any engineering in it. But he said, what I've learned is, it's again, I apologize, but he said, uh, that engineering's not bullshit. This is real work. But the good news is, is you've got structures and systems that can really make it work. But people are gonna have to take the idea of growing their company seriously. And for many years, we haven't had to. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that for many years, companies didn't have to. Before we saw the transformation, and again, you missed some of this video, but before we saw this, before this internet took off, you didn't have to. You could have a product, you could have a service, and nobody knew that you didn't have a very good one or that there were people that had one that was better, and you could get away with it. Well, today that doesn't work, folks. See, the fact of the matter is, is if I look at that graph and I look, it's hard, you can't see it from there, but if I look around 2000 and I look at 2008, here's the deal, the world has changed. It's not going back. And it isn't done yet. Only 40% of the world is connected to the internet right now. It's gonna get bigger. It's gonna be more. And there's somebody somewhere sitting in Africa, sitting in Northern Ireland, coming up with an idea that can transform things. Now we can either be a part of this or we can be a victim of it. And to me, what this movement's about is that we've brought together a group of people who say, there's gotta be a better way. And we can do this, but the world is not going back. It's not going to go back. The old days are gone. And if you don't like it, retirement is an option. I mean, the research shows that those people, it is either the best of time or the worst of time for companies. And companies that get it are cranking forward. They're changing the culture. And companies that don't are gonna die. It's kind of that simple. That's the transformation that we've seen. That's the transformation that we've seen. Our time is up. I'd like to thank you very much. I apologize. Um, I will re-record this cleanly at the front um, and we will post it clean so that you can go through it and I will post it on the blog. If you'd like further information, if you go to innovationengineering.org, you can get more information. And in fact, the, uh, that website is about to change today. It's actually going through an upgrade today. So in fact, if you go later today, you'll actually see the new version of the site as it, as it goes through a major upgrade today. Thank you very much, everybody.